if you look at page numbers 84 and 85, if you look at 84 and 85, this chapter is about, this whole chapter is about disclosures. What you have to disclose, what you don't have to disclose, all this stuff is here on page numbers 84 and 85. One of the first disclosures, one of the first disclosures that's made is the what? Probably the most, maybe one of the more important ones. The agency disclosure, right? The agency disclosure. You're right, I heard somebody say lead. Lead paint's important on pre-78 property for sure. But the very first disclosure we should give the client, I'll show you the document here real quick. If you look at pages 90 and 91, this is literally the first form, a couple pages forward, this is literally the first form that your client should be signing. In fact, there was a case where an agent did not have this form. The seller sued, and the seller was relieved of any duty to pay a commission. So this is a super important form. That's, of course, uh, Juarez versus Damaris, 1993. And if you look at pages 90 and 91, if you kind of look at page 90 to start, What is page 90 saying? Yeah, there's three ways you could represent someone at the top of page 90. You could represent someone just as a seller's agent with a fiduciary duty to the seller, duty of loyalty to the seller. You could represent someone just as a buyer's agent, hit the top of page number 90. Or you could represent someone as a what? Dual agent, representing both the seller and the buyer in the same transaction. So you could be just a seller's agent, you could be just a buyer's agent, or you could be a dual agent representing both the seller and the buyer in the same transaction. Now, at the bottom of page 90, you'll see the term agent at the bottom of 90. Whose name goes in that agent blank? Broker. Excellent, the broker's name. So you might want to write in that blank, you know, Berkshire Hathaway Real Estate, Coldwell Banker, Keller Williams, Shorewood, you know, whatever company you associate with, the name of the broker goes in that agent blank. Then right below the name of the broker, you're going to sign in what? The byline, right? You're going to sign your name as an employee of the company at the bottom of page 90. So it's going to be the name of the broker and then your signature as an agent at that company. Now, a lot of people on page number 91 throw page 91 away because 90 and 91 print together please don't throw page 91 away when you get your license because this has all of the excerpts from the civil code that relate to agency. So it's kind of important. If you look at the bottom of page number 91, you'll see two excerpts from the civil code that are important. 2079.19 and 2079.21. Two very important pieces of, I know it's small, forgive me, on page number 91. I know that font is so damn small. But what does 2079.19 say, uh, Mr. Cordy or Mr. Oliver? 2079.19. <laughs> so, English translation. <laughs> what does that even mean? Commission is excellent, Neil. Money does not what? determine loyalty. So basically, let's say that Century 21 represents a seller. Let's say that Keller Williams represents a buyer. In this transaction, how much money is the buyer paying in commission? None. Nothing, right? The buyer pays nothing. Now, back 60 years ago, when there was like a lawsuit and you tried to figure out who you were loyal to, the seller was like, I don't give a damn about the buyer. I paid both of these guys, B 
because I paid both of them, I own both of them. Both of these guys have to be loyal to me. I'm the one who paid them. I own them. The buyer was like, well, I kind of wasn't given a choice, right? Like, it's not like I have to pay a commission. That's just how the industry works. So now the, there's a portion of the civil code, 2079.19, that says, even if the buyer doesn't pay anything, their agent still has to be what? Loyal, Loyal to them. Payment of compensation does not determine what? Loyalty in an agency relationship. Just because the seller pays C21 and Keller Williams doesn't mean that Keller Williams doesn't owe the buyer. Keller Williams owes the buyer. Century 21 owes the seller regardless of what? Money. Regardless of money. That's 2079.19. Here's dot two one. Forget what the book says, right? We'll just go over it. Keller Williams represents the seller and Keller Williams represents the buyer. What duty does Keller Williams have to both parties? Loyalty, right? Which is, what's that fancy word again for this? Fiduciary. Keller Williams has a fiduciary duty to the seller. Keller Williams has a fiduciary duty to the buyer. Here's what will sometimes happen. I'm not saying anything about any particular broker, but here's what happens sometimes. Buyer writes an offer. Let's say the house is listed at 700. Buyer writes an offer for 675. You wrote this offer, remember, because you represent both of them. You wrote the offer at 675. The husband says to the wife, honey, I don't want to go over 675. The wife goes, you know what? You're so cheap. You're so cheap. Just offer him 700,000. We've looked at like 50 houses. Let's get it over with. Husband's like, 675, it's fine. It's better. You'll thank me later. The wife goes, you know what? Fine. But if this offer gets rejected again, I'm leaving you. Husband's like, okay. You take this offer for 675 to the seller. Remember, you represent both. Seller, well, here, here's what's going to happen, right? The seller's going to say, hey, 675, do you think I'd get, I could get them up a little bit? You know, you saw the look of fear in that man's eyes, right, when the, when the, when the wife was getting a little hard on it. You know that if they counter at 700, they'll probably do the deal. As you're rightly saying, Mina, can you as a dual agent tell the seller that the buyer is willing to pay any more than they originally offered? Yeah. No. Conversely, if you know that this house is listed at 700, but the seller will take as little as 680, because let's say they, you know, they're getting a divorce, a job transfer, whatever, can you tell the buyer that the seller will take any less than originally offered? No. That's 2079.21. A dual agent on page number 91 at the bottom a dual agent cannot tell a buyer that a seller is willing to accept any less, and a dual agent cannot tell a seller that a buyer is willing to what? Pay any more than they originally offered without the express written consent of either party. Just all of it. Yes. Oh, well, uh, this one or this one? But the dual agency. Yeah, knowing that, knowing that the buyer will pay more for the two, can you make the suggestion that they submit a counteroffer? You, you, ah, it's hard. It's, it's, the difficulty is how you phrase that, how you word it. If you say, look, can you, can you get them up? Because the question is going to be, I don't want to scare them away with a hot, too high of a counter. And I'll say, you know what, just write a counteroffer if that's what you want to do, and I'll do my best to sell it. So you have to be very neutral about this because... I just had a student of ours in our Brentwood class come to me on Friday privately at, at the break, and he was telling me about how his father was buying a home for 700000 They had a $20,000 commission, or $20,000, I'm so used to saying commission. They have a $20,000 deposit in escrow. The deal fell apart at the last minute, and uh, the seller is going to keep the deposit. Now, in this case, the guy was a dual agent. And I asked him a bunch of questions, and he goes, well, they didn't disclose that. They didn't say this, or they didn't say that. So when you're in a dual agency situation, it's very, very touchy because you have a duty of loyalty to both sides. You know? So how you phrase these things is very important. Because either way, let's be honest, in a dual agency situation, both sides are going to feel like, often anyway, 
that they weren't adequately represented, right? The seller's going to say, man, this guy favored the buyer. The buyer's going to say this guy favored the seller. It's just kind of natural being in that position. Now, if you look back here, of course, on page numbers 84 and 85, the first two pages of chapter number three, if you look at 84 and 85, understanding disclosures. Where this comes from at the top of page number 85 is this duty to disclose all known material facts. A duty to disclose all known material facts. There is no book that lists all of the things that we have to disclose. There is no book that discloses all of this. There's just this rule that says that you have to disclose what? All known material facts. How would you define the term material fact? How would you define this? Excellent. Any fact that, if known, could basically alter a client's decision. Now, I don't know what might alter your decision until what? Until you sue me, right? Then when you sue me, a court will determine whether or not I disclosed everything. So if the seller says to you, well, the reason I'm selling is the house is haunted. Do you have to disclose the fact that the house is haunted to the buyer? Are there such things as ghosts even? There's no rule that says you have to disclose ghosts on a property, but there's a rule that says that if something could affect someone's decision, what do you have to do? That is, really? You tell me it's on and I'll just sprinkle some holy water, burn a couple pounds of sage, get a good deal, and I'm good, frankly. Yeah, and we'll talk about death. Exactly. So if something could alter someone's decision, now what would I do? If the seller says that the house is haunted, I'll probably throw it, have them put it on the disclosure form anyway and let the buyer make a decision as to whether or not they believe in that, right? There's, you, you're more likely to be in trouble for not disclosing something than over-disclosing something. But you're right. There is no rule that says if the house is haunted, you have to say because who even knows if there's such a thing as ghosts or not? It's just this philosophy on page 85 of all known material facts must be disclosed to a buyer. Now, if you look here on page numbers 86 and 87, you know that Century 21 has this fiduciary duty to a seller, and you know that Keller Williams has a fiduciary duty to the buyer. So Century 21 has fiduciary to the seller, a duty of loyalty. Keller Williams has a fiduciary duty of loyalty to the buyer. A more interesting question at the bottom of page 87 is the following. What duty does Keller Williams have to the seller? What duty does Century 21 have to the buyer? Right? Because now it's not fiduciary. This is to a third party. What does Century 21 owe the buyer? And what does Keller Williams owe the seller? Three things. Exactly. You might want to make a little list of this where it says duty to other party, non-agency at the bottom of 87, you owe three things to a third party. You're right. One of those is disclosure. What else? Honesty. You have a duty to be honest, and you have a duty of what? Fairness. Excellent. So these are three things that you owe a third party in a transaction, a duty of disclosure, a duty of honesty, and a duty of fairness. Do you think that disclosure, fairness, and honesty, are these higher or lower than fiduciary duties? Lower. These are lower than fiduciary. Fiduciary is like to your client. This is the highest duty that the law will recognize, fiduciary. To a third party, you owe a duty of disclosure, you owe a duty of fairness at the bottom of 87, and you owe a duty of honesty. Now, what you'll find on 88 and 89 is this agency disclosure discussion on the next page, agency disclosure. We already talked about what the agency disclosure is. If you look at 90 and 91, again, we have the agency disclosure here. We know there's three ways to represent someone, just a seller's agent, just a buyer's agent, or what? A dual agent representing both the seller and the buyer in the same transaction. This right here, Century 21 seller, Keller Williams buyer, is this single agency or dual agency here? 
There you go. This is single agency. No problem. It's single agency. This is what? Dual. Dual agency. One broker representing both the seller and the buyer in the same transaction, of course, is dual agency, which creates a fiduciary duty to both sides. Now, if you're going to act as a dual agent, do you think that you have to disclose that you're a dual agent? Of course, right? If you do, if you do it and don't disclose it, you won't be entitled, frankly, to a commission. And this agency disclosure follows three steps. And you'll see these three on page numbers 92 and 93. There are three steps to an agency disclosure, DEC. The three steps are disclose, elect, confirm. The three steps are disclose. First, if you're going to act as a dual agent, what's the first step? Disclosing, hey, look, I'm acting as a dual agent. Sign here. Then the client gets to what? Elect, Elect or choose whether or not they will allow the dual agency. Because isn't it true that if the client doesn't feel comfortable with the dual agency, they can disallow it? Yes. That's true. Finally, once they've elected to allow it, then what? Confirm. You're going to confirm the dual agency. So three steps to agency disclosure. Make the disclosure. I'm a dual agent. Second step is what? Elect. Have them choose the dual agency. And the final step is what again? Confirm, Confirm right? Confirm the dual agency. Yes, sir. How often does that happen with dual agents? Well, it depends. That's a great question. The question is how often do agents act as a dual agent? A couple of responses. First, agents like this or hate it? Love it. Love it. Because they get the full commission, right? More money. And they have more control. More control over the transaction. Fine. I agree. The other piece to this is it depends on how the market's operating. If you look back at the summer of 2013, this was actually quite common because how did the inventory look? Low. Very low. So you had a lot of agents that would just hold a couple of open houses and get their own buyer. Maybe not in the best interest of, frankly, maybe even either party because now you have divided loyalty. You kind of can't super confide, you could argue, in your agent because you know they're also working for the other side. So in a tight inventory market like we had over the summer, probably more common than would be good. But in a lower, in a, in a, in a, in a high inventory situation, in a buyer's market, you'll see more of this because you just want the deal done and you'll get deals through the MLS. Yes, sir. And then no. Then you have to have, the question is, what happens if the seller says that, or the buyer says that they don't want the dual agency? then the buyer would have to be represented by some other agency. So you have to tell the buyer, go get another agent and then write the offer. And half of your commission also goes to the other side. Yes, ma'am, and then the... Um, just a question about the dual agent. That refers mainly to the broker, right? It's a great point. If you have two sales people right. Right. So the question is, does dual agency refer to, is it the brokerage or the salesperson? Mm -hmm. A great question. It's, and it's, the answer is it's the brokerage. If you yourself have a listing and you yourself find the buyer, clearly that is still dual agency, right? Because it's you. If you work at this office here in Santa Monica and you sit way over there, and I work in this office in Santa Monica and I sit way over there, we don't even know each other, but we both work at the same brokerage, is that still dual agency? Yeah. It is, right? So you're right. It, it refers to the brokerage, not the individual salesperson. Although, obviously, if the individual salesperson reps the seller and the buyer, that's still dual agency, but it's bigger than that. It's the same brokerage. And some big companies, like, I'll give you two big ones. There's a company called Coldwell Banker NRT, 6,000 agents all over California. Coldwell Banker in San Francisco has a listing. I'm with Coldwell Banker in Mission Viejo and we're both in NRT office, we do a deal together, that is still dual agency, right? Big companies like Berkshire Hathaway, that used to be called Prudential California Realty. Prudential is no more. They're all turned to Berkshire Hathaway. If you work at Berkshire Hathaway in West Hollywood in the Pacific Design Center, and I work at Berkshire Hathaway in Del Mar in San Diego, we put a deal together that is also still dual agency.
advise the client. Yeah, right. Them, you know, right. You just couldn't say, I, you couldn't say, I think you should counter them more because I know that this buyer is blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? A very, very gray area, though, right, as a dual agent. That's why some companies, not most, but a few, actually don't allow dual agency because they feel like you might be buying litigation in the process because what does the seller want? Top dollar. What does the buyer want? The house for free. And then you're kind of in the middle of that as a dual agent. So, yes, ma'am. You can't, you, so whoever that buyer is that's being, is in your story rep by someone from another state, that wouldn't be possible because in order to rep a buyer for a property in California, you need to be licensed in California. Ma'am and then, sir. Go ahead. And then we'll by writing an offer and getting it accepted. You know, you can't tell them, you can't coach them based on information that you have about the other side. Does that make sense? No. Because I don't think they're getting that it's dual agency, that's why. I mean, supposing I'm buying this house for 600, if somebody is offering 650 or somebody is still, how would they know? Um, well, because you represent the seller. Right? So if, if I represent the seller, I know that there's an offer at 600. Yeah, if you're not a dual agency, then this doesn't apply. Okay. Right? Because you don't have any information about the buyer. You don't have a, the buyer's agent doesn't have any information about the seller. And then you're representing both of them. Yes. You would know, if you represent the seller, you would know what offers you have, right? Because the buyer's agents are submitting those offers directly to you. And then the, the broker will determine which one to take, right? Well, the seller will determine which one to take. On the counsel of the broker, yes. Yes, sir. Getting into the out-of-state thing, say I have a client in California that wants to buy real estate in New York. I can call an agent and set something up. And, and you would get a 25 to 30 percent referral I, fee. I would make a very standard. You and you make a nice referral fee yeah. too. If it's a 700,000 dollar property, 20,000 dollar check, you would get like five grand yeah. just for picking up the phone and making one phone call. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely, ma'am, and then David. And then we'll move on. Right. And you know that there's multiple offers on a property. And the seller would know that too, because you would have presented those offers to the seller. Right. Right. Would you be able to, if your buyer is, I guess, asking you for direction? Right. Would you be able to tell them that there is multiple offers? Yes, unless you have confidentiality agreements signed with the buyers, the other buyers that have written offers. There's no law that says that a listing agent can't tell a buyer's agent or just someone interested in the property the number of offers and the terms of those offers, although local market practice will dictate whether or not that's done. A lot of older real estate agents like myself won't do that. If somebody calls me and I have six offers, I might say, look, I have multiple offers. They'll ask me what those offers are. I could tell them what those offers are, but the way I was brought up, I don't do that. But that's my option. Not, it's not by law. Some agents will tell them there's six offers ranging from 950 to a million eight. You know, do what you want to do. That's why some agents do it. They'll disclose that because they want to drive the price up. But based on how a lot of older agents were trained, that wasn't industry practice, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, David, and then, one, then we'll move on. You good? That's true. No, they will. They will. Yeah, so most brokers want dual agency, frankly, because it just means more money for the, for the firm, right? So Now, if you look here really quickly on page number 97, there are, you'll see the transfer disclosure statement on page 97. There are two forms that I would say are like sacrosanct. I mean, they are like, you have to know how and when to use them. The first one is the one we already talked about, the agency disclosure, right? 
single agent, dual agent, fiduciary duty, civil code, all that. The next one is this on 97. It is the transfer disclosure statement. This is a three-page form, and it is like, it's hard to overemphasize how critical this form is. So who fills this out, do you think? Seller or buyer? Don't say buyer. The seller, right? The seller fills out this form. If you look at the bottom of 97, this form, the first page of the TDS, you'll see all these little black squares at the bottom of page number 97. The purpose of these black square, of all these little squares is for the seller to put check marks by all the stuff that they have. Sprinkler system, garage door opener, you know, water heater, dishwasher, oven, range, whatever, microwave. And then at the bottom of this page, it asks, to the best of your knowledge, are any of these not working? So the purpose of this is what? To transparently disclose to the buyer whatever's wrong with the property. Look at page number 97, this first page. Do you see any place on this page for the agent to sign? No, the agent doesn't touch this form. In fact, I'd go so far as to say you want to have a different color pen for your seller than you use on the third page, which we'll look at in a second, because you want to make sure that it's obvious that the seller filled this out and it wasn't you on page number 97. But this is just stuff on 97 that relates to the physical condition of the property. Aren't there some things that might affect your decision to buy that aren't related to something not working. Can you think of something that would maybe piss you off if you found out and the seller didn't tell you? Somebody died in the or even if, let's say, something was done without permits. Let's say you find out that that 600-square-foot game room was made without permits. Would you want to know that? Yes. Probably so. Would you want to know if there's a zoning violation or a pending lawsuit on the property before you buy it? Hell, would you even want to know if the guy next door raises German shepherds for police work. Yeah, you're going to be barking all the time. So page number 98, the next page, basically looks at a lot of these things. Neighborhood noise or nuisance problems, you know, any violation of zoning ordinances, anything made without permits. All this is here, of course, on page number 98. What is page 99? Because on page 99, page 99 is for the agent. You see agent signatures on 99. What caused this? Do you remember this? Uh, Easton, uh, Jeff, excellent. Easton versus Strasburger. And you'll see on page number 100, you'll see here on page number 100 where it says agent's inspection disclosure here on page 100. Basically, what, ha what caused this was a 1984 lawsuit. Don't worry about a lot of these lawsuit names for the exam. You don't necessarily need to know them. But there are two that you need to know for sure. One we talked about already, Jones versus Mayer. Do you remember what, what Jones versus Mayer did? Discrimination in private real estate sales, right? Jones versus Mayer, 1968. The other one is 1984, Easton versus Strasburger here on page 100. Easton versus Strasburger. Basically, what happened in Easton was that a house was built on, like, some topography that had settling problems. There were soil problems here with this property. What happens when there's soil problems? Yeah, you get cracks on the walls. Windows and doors don't close properly. The floor might even be a little uneven. In fact, in this case, the agent even testified that the agent saw exposed netting on a hillside. Bless you. Why might there be exposed netting on a hillside? Yeah, to keep the land in place, right? What really pissed the buyer off in this case, as you might remember from another class, what did the buyer pay here? 170 After they bought it, the cost to fix it? 213 That's what really pissed the buyer off, right? The guy buys the house. Remember, this is, this is a lot of money now, but this is a lot of money in 80, the early 80s. Guy buys the house for 170 cost to fix it 213 Guy's pissed. Sues everyone. Now, out of this case, every time we sell a residential one to four unit property, commercial properties are exempt. But any time you sell a residential one to four unit property, 
what do you have to do? Visual inspection. You have to do a visual inspection of normally accessible areas in the property, right? So you got to look around, and if you see cracks and the windows look messed up, and you see, bless you, you see all these problems, what do you have to do? Write it down. Write it down. you got to do this visual inspection. Now, you could put this back on page 99. You'll see that both agents... Both the listing agent and the buyer's agent, top of page 99, Roman numeral 3, that's for the listing agent. Roman numeral 4 is for the buyer's agent at the middle of page 99. Every time we sell a house, without exception, we have to do a what again? Visual inspection. Under what lawsuit? Easton, right? Easton versus Strasburger, 1984, explained on page 100. Kind of sucks now for us because now we're not just liable for what we know. We're also liable for what we should have known based on some reasonable visual inspection. It's quite scary now. So if you miss something, or if any of us miss something, there's potential liability, which sucks. Yes, sir? Great point. We don't have to go up into the attic or into the roof. It's just normally accessible areas. So if there's a locked bedroom, we don't have to you know, get in. If the seller has a bunch of fur coats and a closet, we don't have to move those fur coats to the side and look behind it. It's just normally accessible areas in the property. There was another case here. If you look, actually, let me show you one thing here real quick on page number 101 at the bottom, where it says insect infestation at the bottom of page 100. For the state exam, I would write the following at the bottom of 100. I would write the words two termite inspections dash disclose both to buyer. If you have a listing and you get two termite inspections, which is not uncommon, let's say you get one termite inspection and the bid comes back $6,000, the seller freaks and wants a second opinion. Get a second opinion, second opinion comes back 1200 bucks. What are you going to do, 6000 or 1200 Go do 1200 Do you have to show the $6,000 report to the buyer too? You do. So two termite inspections, fine, but you have to show the buyer both termite inspections. Very, very, very important here on page number 101 and 102. Bottom of 102, you'll know this term already. You'll see it in bold at the bottom of 102. The term is a red flag at the bottom half of 102 in bold. How would you define the term uh, red flag? Right, like a, some visual sign of what could be a bigger problem. So some sign of what could be a bigger problem, of course, is a red flag. Now, the only two lawsuits, Easton versus Strasburger says what again? Visual, visual inspection. Jones versus Mayer says no discrimination on private property. But there's another lawsuit that you don't need to know for the test, but it's interesting. It's Reed versus King, 1983. Reed versus King was crazy. What happened to Reed, Reed King again, if you remember, if you've had a law class already? Mother and four of her kids murdered in a home. Wild, right? So, but this was 10 years prior. So the seller didn't want to volunteer this information to a buyer. For obvious reasons. Buyers might be spooked, right? I don't want to buy this house where five people were murdered. But it was 10 years ago. So the guy says, ah, screw it. 10 years is a long time. I'm not going to say anything. In fact, it came out that the seller actually went to a bunch of the neighbors and said, look, don't F up my deal. Just say nothing to the buyer. Let's just sell this house for top dollar and move on. Obviously, when the buyer bought it, what happened? The neighbors came over, right, and said, man, I can't believe you bought this house because blah, 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 blah. Buyer freaks, sues the seller and the agent and everything. Who won that case, do you think, buyer or seller? Buyer, buyer right? Seller was found liable for not disclosing, but that was 83. So now, how often do you think there's a quintuple murder on a property? Not often, right? Not often. So we needed a set of rules about death that was more applicable to the majority of transactions. Now, if you look at page number 103, 
we've replaced Reed versus King with uh, 1710.2 of the Civil Code. What are all rules about death now on a property? How many years? Three. three. Excellent. Three years. Somebody died on a property within the last three years. You have to volunteer that death to a buyer. You know, don't wait for them to ask. Just tell them, hey, look, by the way, somebody died on the property last year. Now, naturally, if I tell you somebody died on the property last year, your question back to me is going to be what? How'd they die? I tell you how they died. Unless, rule number two, they died how? AIDS. If they died due to AIDS, so if they died of a heart attack, suicide, homicide, whatever, you disclose it. You just don't disclose how they died if they died due to AIDS. How come? Stigma, right? Isn't there even now, Magic Johnson who came out in like, what, 91? It's now 2014, basically. I mean, he looks healthier now than he did then, frankly. So, you know, there's still, though, a social stigma associated with it. Like, man, I don't want to buy that house. That's the AIDS house. Or I don't want to live there. I might get HIV, too, or whatever. So they just have a rule carved out for AIDS. Third rule about death, and then I'll take any questions you might have about this. Third rule about death. If the buyer asks, let's say somebody died six years ago. Do I have to volunteer the death, volunteer the death six years ago to you? No. But if I'm walking through the house with my buddy, and I'm showing him the house, and I'm like, hey, I'm about to buy this house. And my buddy goes, you know what, man, this house feels weird. And I'm like, what do you mean it feels weird? He goes, it just feels weird. I bet you someone died here. If I ask, if I make a direct inquiry to the seller, did anybody ever die on this property, and the seller knows, now they have to tell me because now I'm telling you that that fact is what? Material. That fact may affect my decision. So three rules about death. First rule about death Within the last three years, then what? Three years, I have to volunteer it, right? Three years, I have to just tell you. I don't wait for you to ask. I just tell you. Second rule, I don't disclose how they died if it was what? AIDS. Now, ironically, if I tell you somebody died last year and you ask me, well, how'd they die? And I say, I can't tell you. Then you know, because that's the only exception under the civil code for this. If I ask, I make a direct inquiry, not about the AIDS piece, but I ask, did anybody ever die here and you know? Now what? Have to, I, was, I was at the... Even if it was a, like, you bought it from someone and then you just died like many years ago and now you're selling it to someone else and you live with that property for many years yourself. You have to tell them if you know. If, they, somebody, if, if I bought my house in 78 and they said, hey, look, somebody died in 74 and I know... Even though that was so long ago, 40 years, I still have to tell you about it if you ask. So if you don't know about the death, you have to find out? Uh, no, you just say that you don't know. Yes, sir, John. You have to say that someone died, but you don't have to say how unless they ask, right? Ex except that on the form that this is done on, it's done on a form called the SPQ, or Seller Property Questionnaire. Yeah. You could use an SSD also, Supplemental Statutory Disclosure, but it's normally on the SPQ. That form, there's one of nine questions on the first page. One of the questions is, did an occupant ever die in the last three years? Yes or no? And then at the bottom it says, if the answers to any of the above are yes, please explain. And it has a bunch of lines. So the form prompts you to tell them. Yeah. Does this apply to leasing the property? It does. Three years. Yeah. So why is AIDS disclosed? Just a bit of a social stigma, a bit. You know, a lot of people are like, ah, I don't want to live there. That's the AIDS house. You know, I might get it too. I don't want to use that toilet. We get all sorts of weird things, you know. So people just, they just carve an exception out for HIV and AIDS. You, of course, don't die from AIDS itself. You would die from some complication associated with it, right? So, but AIDS would still be listed on the birth, some immune deficiency would still be listed on the birth, on the death certificate, rather. There's always a form, yeah. Yeah, and if you want to, like, there's always a form. If you want to search for that form, you can search Seller Property Questionnaire PDF, and then you'll find that form online. Do you have to give that form to the buyer? Yes, but... No, you have to give it to them. That's the real form. You still give them the form, 
Yeah, and if the form asks in the last three years. You're asking a technical question about the form. The form that's statutorily required is called an SSD, or Supplemental Statutory Disclosure. But then we've expanded the SSD into another form called the SPQ, which asks a bunch of other questions. The form that's required is the SSD, but the SPQ is what we use, and part of the SPQ is the old SSD. How would you know someone's out there if the seller didn't tell you? You wouldn't. Then you're not responsible. You're less likely to be responsible. I'm not saying you're not going to be sued. You'll be sued, but you're less likely to be responsible because the, the form asks the seller, and the seller signs the form, not us. The seller signs the form. Right, the seller signs it. So last couple of things, and we'll take a little break here. If you look here um, on page number 107, we'll look at this, and we'll take a little break from Chapter 3. So if you look at page 107, you'll see the NHD, or Natural Hazard Disclosure Form. What does this form do? What does it look like? Disclosure about what? Yeah, whether the, the property is in an earthquake zone, a fire zone, a flood zone, right? So we're going to answer these questions. Notice the seller is the one that signs it. The truth of the matter is, though, do you think the seller actually knows technically if the property is in an earthquake zone, fire zone, or flood zone? Do you think the seller actually knows that? Who knows? It's California. You might say, well, a whole state is an earthquake zone. But technically, not the, the whole state isn't in an area of high seismic activity. So... Yes, on page 107, you could have the seller fill out this form, but I would much rather you use a third party. An example of this would be propertyid.com or even a company like disclosuresource.com. So these companies, Property ID or Disclosure Source, their whole purpose for existing is hazard disclosures. What do they cost? Like 90 bucks. So the seller would pay this disclosure company $90, and the disclosure company would make the necessary disclosures from page 107. So we don't actually make these disclosures. Hell, I wouldn't even have the seller make these disclosures. You probably just want to what? Pay some third party, and they'll make the disclosures for you just so you don't have the liability of trying to interpret like a seismic map or something like that. Do you have any questions about Chapter 3 at all? Let's just do a quick, yeah, Mr. Oliver. Exactly. 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 So escrow or you would order the report, but the bill would be sent to escrow and paid through escrow. Yes, sir. This will take 24 hours from these companies. They have a one-day turnaround. Yeah. Five-question review. Number one. How often should a broker's trust account be reconciled? Monthly. Monthly. Number two, there are three steps to the agency disclosure process. What are they again? Disclose, elect, and then confirm. Disclose, elect, confirm. Number three, death on a property must be volunteered to the buyer if the death happened when? Within the last three years. There's an exception for cause of death if AIDS. Two more. The lawsuit that requires agents conduct a visual inspection is Easton. Remember that? Easton versus Strasburger. Easton versus Strasburger. Last one. True or false? The most important component of selecting a brokerage is commission split. The most important component. Probably not. What's the most important? When you choose a broker to work for? It's not commission split. It's probably what? What's your question? Training, right? Training, right? Training is the most important aspect in choosing, especially as a new agent, choosing a brokerage to affiliate with. Let me show you something here real quick on page number 110. Right at the bottom of page number 110, you'll see the term lead-based paint at the bottom of page number 110. There are potentially... Uh, three questions on your exam uh, about lead-based paint, and I want to give all three of those to you now. So, three questions, right, about lead paint. Now, of course, you know that lead paint is an environmental hazard. It's paint with lead in it, which is not good. So, about 80% of the time on the test, you'll see the question asked this way. Property built prior to what year requires a lead paint disclosure? Pre-78, right? Super important for the test. Property built 
prior to 1978 requires that the seller deliver to the buyer a lead-based paint disclosure. Now, what do you suppose the lead-based paint disclosure actually says? What do you think it actually says? Excellent. That it may have lead paint. Not that it has it or that it doesn't. It just says it might have it. And if this is important to you as a buyer, do a test. So pre-78, we need a lead paint disclosure. Kind of a mind trip question. Property built after what year does not require a lead paint disclosure? After 77. So, so we'll just chart this out, right? 76, 77, 78, 79. Here it is. Pre-78, we need it. After 77, we don't. So in 77, do we need lead paint? Yes. In 76, yes. In 78, no. In 79, no. So again, pre-78 will require the lead paint. After 77, will not require a lead paint disclosure. Pre-78, we need it. After 77, we do not need lead paint. Most of the time, you'll see the question asked this way, right? Property built prior to what year requires lead paint pre-78, after 77, does not. Third question, property was built in 1974. What do we need? Lead paint. The seller and the agent, honestly and truthfully, just didn't know whether or not the property had lead paint. They didn't know. Based on the fact that they didn't know, they failed to deliver lead paint to the buyer. Is that okay? No, if you, whether or not, you, it doesn't even say that it has it or that it doesn't. It just says that it might. So who's liable in this case? Just the seller, just the agent, or are both liable? They're both liable, right? They're both liable for failure to deliver the lead-based paint disclosure to the buyer. So very important, of course, lead paint here on page number 110. Now, a couple of things that are also important here real quick on... Um, Page number 116, if you look at page 116 and 117, particularly, actually, really quickly here, um, I just want to show you one fast thing um, on page numbers 116 and 117, particularly at the bottom of page 117 where it says RESPA at the bottom of 117, RESPA. It is important at the bottom of 117 just to know what RESPA stands for. RESPA stands for the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. A couple of things about RESPA that we should know for the test, potentially on the test but not in the book. So you might want to make some notes of these here at the bottom of the page. The first thing that I would write next to RESPA is I would write the words prohibits kickbacks. RESPA prohibits kickbacks. What's a kickback? Yes, basically a bribe. From who, though? From who to who? From lenders. From a lender to who? To the agent. To the real estate agent. Excellent. So this is from the settlement provider to who? To the real estate agent. So an escrow company could not, like, somehow put their arm around you and say, look, for every escrow that you give us, we'll give you 50 bucks. Totally illegal, a violation of what law? RESPA in a form of a kickback, right? From, it, from RESPA, it's a form of a kickback. Now, be careful, though. Does RESPA allow you, as the real estate agent, to give money back to your client? Yeah. You could discount your commission to the seller. You could give money back to the buyer as long as it's disclosed on the closing statement. So the problem here is not real estate agent to client. The problem here is settlement provider to who? Agent. To real estate agent. Now, probably one of the most misunderstood and common questions that I get, I probably get this question like every week. Well, pull me aside and say the following. Right now, you don't have a license yet. You'll have a license in a, a couple of months maybe or whatever, but you don't have a license today. So at least once a week, somebody will pull me aside and like they're about to tell me a secret, like, hey, I have a client uh, already. I got somebody who I know wants to buy, but, you know, I don't have a license yet. What do I do? They say, can I refer them to you? And I, of course, say, no, no, I don't, I don't 
take any clients from them. It's cool, but find a real estate agent and figure it out, right? So they'll call me the next day. Hey, I found an agent that wants to work with my client. That probably wasn't too hard to find an agent that wants to work with your buyer or seller. But they say, can I get a referral fee? The student who is not currently licensed will ask me, I have a client of mine. Can I get a referral fee from an agent? Common question, right? Can an unlicensed person get paid a referral fee from an agent? Yes. Yeah. What is the answer to that? Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So can you get a referral fee? So, so here's the answer to that question, right? The answer to the question is it depends. So can an unlicensed person get money for something that would have required a license? Obviously not. So like, I can't tell you, look, here's my super key. You know, here's my MLS access. You find the client, you put the deal together. When you need me, I'll, I'll come sign my name. Obviously illegal because you can't do those activities without having a license. Is this, sorry? But. And we're not naive. We know that unfortunately, you know, cash is transferred in an envelope all the time, but that's not and it's, it's regulating that is very difficult, frankly, right? Here's the rule, and I'm hoping you'll follow the rule. Here's the rule. RESPA, state or federal? Federal, right? It covers all 50 states. The state of California, you're right, doesn't care. The Bureau of Real Estate in California doesn't care whether you pay someone that is unlicensed a referral fee. They're good with it. The problem is RESPA. If it is a residential transaction with a loan, how many residential transactions do you think involve a loan? Like most of them, right? It triggers a provision under RESPA that prohibits unlicensed people from getting anything. If it was a commercial transaction cash, cool. Commercial transaction with a loan, fine. Residential transaction cash, fine. Residential transaction with a loan triggers a provision inside of RESPA that would prohibit you from paying, getting paid anything. But Neil's right. You know agents out there, there's 410,000 real estate licensees in California. You know that at some point, many of them are doing something that would embarrass us. It is illegal to pay someone on a residential transaction with a loan a referral fee when they don't have a license. That not, that's not going to make you happy. But that, I'm just telling you what the rule is. So it's a with a loan, can't pay an unlicensed person anything. Because if, if they don't tell each other, it isn't enough. It's like any law, right? Right. I'm not even disagreeing with you. I, I'm, I'm just telling you what the rule is. You know, <laughs> residential with a loan can't pay. Any, anything else, commercial cash, residential cash, re commercial loan, um, you know, business opportunity. Residential cash just triggers RESPA, that's all. You're good. RESPA doesn't regulate that. Residential, one to four unit. Exactly. Now, the very, very last thing here from this chapter that I want to share with you is the pages 122 and 123. Oh, yeah. RESPA prohibits kickbacks, and also RESPA requires one last thing. Forgive me. It also requires a good faith estimate, which you're, I'm hoping you remember. Good faith estimate is an estimate of what? The closing costs in the loan issued by who? The lender to the borrower within three business days. Within three business days of you applying for a loan, RESPA says the lender has to give the borrower a what? Good faith estimate of the closing costs associated with the loan. So these are two big things inside of RESPA. Prohibits kickbacks. Good faith estimate within three business days. 
Also, you can't pay an unlicensed person a referral fee on a residential transaction with a loan. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely not. That's 101, RESPA 101. The question is, if, if let's say I have a loan officer that works at Wells Fargo that's a buddy of mine, and I refer him a loan, can he give me money for referring the loan? Absolutely 1,000%, no, never, totally illegal, violation of what? RESPA, a form of a kickback. Yes, sir. No, you're good. So write it next to RESPA. RESPA requires that the lender provide who? A borrower with a document called a good faith estimate, which is an estimate of the closing costs associated with the loan within how many days? Within three business days of that borrower applying for the loan. So the last couple of things here are uh, here on page numbers 122 and 123 from this chapter. The first is at the very top of page number 122, you'll see Megan's Law. You'll see Megan's Law. Megan's Law requires that sex offenders must what? Register. Do you think that when you sell a property, the seller is going to give the buyer on page number 122, do you think the seller is going to give the buyer a list of all the sex offenders in the area? No shot. What are they going to do? Tell you there is a list. And if this is something that concerns you, you're welcome to check the list, right? That's, of course, Megan's Law. The second thing that is important here is on page number 123 at the top, smoke detector and water heater at the top of 123. All properties must have an operable smoke detector. Also, water heaters have to be what? Strapped, braced, anchored to resist falling in the event of an earthquake. Last thing from this page, uh, this section anyways, at the bottom of 123, supplemental property tax bill. This is pretty important because you know when you sell a property, when you sell a piece of real estate, this triggers a what? Reassessment in the property taxes, right? So when you sell, if I sold you, let's say my house is worth 500000 but I bought it back in the day for 100 my property taxes are still real low. They're still like around 100000 But when I sell it to you for 500 this triggers excellent an increase in taxes. Now here's what's going to happen. The property tax year ends on June 30th of a given year, right? That's when the property tax year finishes. Now, let's say that you close escrow on my house on May 1st. So you're the buyer. You close escrow on May 1st. From May 1st until June 30th, those two months, May and June, escrow is going to bill who? Buyer or seller? Buyer. Escrow is going to bill the buyer because you just bought the house May 1st. I don't have to pay the property taxes for May and June. I don't own that thing anymore, right? The buyer is going to pay the property taxes for these two months. That money, though, is going to be collected when? At the close of escrow, right? Now, remember, I bought my house back in the day for 100 Today it's worth $500, let us say. These taxes for these two months are going to be collected based on the old value of 100. Now, at some point through the next year, call it October, November, whatever, the county assessor is going to wake up and realize, hey, what the hell? This house sold. But we were only getting taxes based on an assessed value of 100. We're going to send this buyer a pretty mean letter saying, you owe us for the difference between the 100 we got and the 500 it is. Do you think that the buyer might be pissed sometime in the next year when they get a nice, fat, three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 supplemental tax bill that the agent didn't tell them about? Oh, they're going to be pissed, right? So you have to tell your buyer about this. At some point in the next year, you are going to get a what again? Supplemental property tax bill representing the difference between what we closed the escrow at 
and what the new assessed value is. You're going to get that. I don't know when it's going to come because it just, it just shows up when they get around to it. But you will get a nice, fat, supplemental property tax bill. This, of course, is here on page 123 at the middle. The seller should tell the buyer that what? There's this new tax called, or this reassessment anyway, you're going to get a supplemental tax bill through the next year. Yes, ma'am. No. So if you have an impound account with a lender, the lender will collect impounds on the current assessed value because they don't know what's gonna be, what it's going to be reassessed. It will be reassessed at around the purchase price normally for most transactions, but you'll still, in an impound, not get the full, true, new property taxes. You're going to get that supplemental tax bill even, on a, even, on a, uh, even if there's a new loan. Now, remember, if I've had this house for like 20 years and I refi, Will that trigger a reassessment? Just the refinance, will it trigger a reassessment? No. There's only two things that trigger the reassessment. What are the two? Sale and an addition, right? Like a major addition, let's say, to the property. Refinancing has no tax effect whatsoever. So refinances, but won't trigger a new, new assessed value. But to answer your question in another way, if you have an impound account when you buy it, you'll still get the SPT or supplemental property tax notice because they're only escrowing or collecting based on the old value. It's based on whatever the county assessor thinks that the property is worth based on the time of transfer. So the county assessor, that's their job, is to figure out what everyone's assessed value is. Nine and a half times out of ten, though, the assessed value ends up being what? The sales price, right? Whatever they bought it at. Um, what about the modern? Is there anything that's the county, yeah, a major improvement, the quote improvement. So depending on the assessor in an area, if you like gut the whole thing, it may still trigger the reassessment. And they exactly because you're going to pull the permits as a red flag. Now. There's a chart here at the end of Chapter 3, a disclosure chart that lists some of the most common disclosures. And if you come to, just, if you just come to the next couple pages, just this whole rest of the, pay, of, of the chapter, you'll see a disclosure chart that is basically a list of the most common disclosures and the forms that this triggers. All the, you're, you're looking at them right now, right? All, all those pages. It's just a chart that um, lists all the disclosures. I'll, I'll let you look at that uh, on your own.